so um, before we get started with uh, what we're going to be doing today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to be doing next week because we are going to be shifting gears a little bit, right? So um, on Tuesday, we're going to take uh, the material we've been talking about this past Tuesday and today, and we're going to talk about how to use that to generate um, a real thesis statement and how to use your thesis statement to organize and arrange uh, a longer paper, right? We're going to be moving then from doing some readings uh, in uh, philosophy, right? I'm going to be giving you some philosophy essays, I'm going to be splitting you up into groups, and each group is going to have to explain and defend their particular philosopher's position, right? Each of the four philosophers that you'll be given will be talking about the same basic thing, but their attitudes towards it are different, right? So you are going to be trying to tell me and the rest of the class why your philosopher is right about this, whether you actually agree with them or not. And um, the groups are going to be consistent throughout, right? So you'll always be working with the same people. So what I want you to be doing, right, is rotating different roles in the group so that everybody participates, right, so that everybody has a chance to, I'll, I'll tell you what sorts of things I want you to be doing when we get a little bit closer to it. And the goal of these is going to be to produce short reflection papers, right. For each session we're doing this, you're going to produce a 500 word reflection paper outlining and defending your philosopher's position. And that's going to then lead into your first real paper, right. Um, and I'm going to be giving you a question to answer for that paper that you'll then be using these philosophical essays to try to answer. So it's going to be an argument using sources, but they're going to be sources that I've given to you. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about any of this yet? I hope things will become a little bit more clear when we get closer to it. Yeah, Nick? No, I will assign uh, groups. And, you know, if it turns out that certain people simply can't work together, you know, then come let me know and we'll see if we can rearrange things. But, yeah, I will be picking your groups. Um, mostly because I've been, you know, I've been observing you long enough to, to note who's already, you know, who in the class are already friends and who are not. And I find that it's generally more productive if you're working with people that you don't really know all that well yet. You'll be fine. <laughs> any, any other questions? Okay, great. Then um, we're going to start by revisiting an image that I had you guys pick apart a couple sessions ago. We're going to do something a little bit different with it this time. I know it is dark, and it is 2 o'clock, and it is after lunch, and it is right before Labor Day, but please, please, please do not fall asleep. Okay, so does everybody remember this? Okay, right, we were doing a summary exercise of this, right? You were just doing description. So we're going to try something a little bit different now. I'm going to give you a little bit of context about this picture and what it is. So. This is a book cover. The novel contained therein is called Trout Fishing in America. It's published. 1967, and I'm going to give you just one more piece of information about it. Um, the location for the photograph is a famous park in San Francisco. So here is what I want you to try to think about as you look at this. Right, first. 
what is the rhetorical purpose of a book cover, right? What's a book cover supposed to do? Secondly, what kind of audience do you think this is aimed at and why? And the third thing that I want you to do is simply look for patterns of similarity binary oppositions and anomalies right so anomalies are things that don't seem to quite fit or that seem out of place right so we can pick one thing out pretty much immediately here right what do we usually expect to see on the front cover of a book? Pardon? The title. Yeah, we expect to see the title, right? And what else? The author's, the author's name, right? So what's missing from this? Yeah, there are no, I mean, there's a little, you know, bookseller's mark at the corner, right? But yeah, there's no title, and the author's name is not present either, right? So think about what that might have to do with the way this cover is being presented to us, or how this functions as a book cover, right? All right, so once you think you have answers to any of these basic questions, right, then just feel free to speak up. It might actually best to do, be, be best to do number three first. And keep thinking in terms of these, this context that I've given you, right? When this was produced, where it was produced, and what it is. Yeah, Jackson. Does it get cold in San Francisco? Pardon? Does it get cold in San Francisco? It does get quite, it's, yeah, cold and wet. Climate's not unlike, say, like Seattle or Portland, but a little bit warmer.
The figure in the back, by the way, I think we determined last time is uh, Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, it's a statue of Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, and yeah, essentially, yeah, what, what, is, what, is the, what does the publisher want you to do? Yeah, the publisher wants you, to, wants you to pick the damn thing up, right, open it, see this is interesting, and then go, go pay for it, right? It's an advertisement for the store. Exactly, it's an advertisement. Well, it's an advertisement for the book anyway, right? Does this look like the advertisement for a particular story? Not fishing. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't appear to have anything to do with fishing, right? Maybe it's a metaphor. <laughs> but if 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 it is a metaphor, is it a metaphor that we have enough information to unpack? No. No. Yeah. So if it is a metaphor for fishing in some way, or if fishing is a metaphor for this. We don't have enough to go on, right? I feel like the cover succeeds because it will make this look either the um, back, like the side yeah. of the book, or open the book to see what the title is. At least we'll fit. We'll, at least we'll want to figure out, right? Okay, what is this called, and who is the author, right? So leaving off that basic information in and of itself is a strategy designed to get you to pick up the book, right? Now, what about the general visual presentation here? Right, so it's a famous park in San Francisco. The year is 1967. The photo is definitely a lot older. Like, like, like it's taken in a much older time, and it's weird that they used that picture. Okay. Old, older than now or older than 1967? No, older than 1967. Okay, what, what makes you think that this photo is from an, old, an older period than 1967? The grain of the photo and the way it looks and the way they're dressed. It's also the yellow and the images Yeah, well, I mean, have, 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 you ever, have you ever picked up a book from the 60s? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the yellowing actually happens pretty late. I, I've got, you know, books that I bought as a student in the 90s that are yellowed like this. So yeah, the yellowing actually happens pretty quickly. So what I would suggest, is like think instead about what this might say about the sort of people they'd be trying to reach in 1967. Hippies. Why would you say hippies, Ezra? Just outdoorsy. Okay, it's outdoors, right? Yeah. Would the city in which the picture is taken have anything to do with that? Yeah. Yeah, San Francisco is gonna be the epicenter of the hippie movement in the late 60s, right? And do these people look like um, normal, straight-laced, office-working types? No. Yeah, their their hair shaggy, right? They have you know facial hair when you know more conservative people would have been um, well, he has facial hair when more conservative men would have been clean shaven. Um, he's wearing jeans. She's dressed a little eccentrically and has her legs kind of splayed in a casual fashion, right? So yeah, so the basic audience that this is trying to reach, right, would be a more kind of counterculture audience, right? Not trying to reach the normals. Who would expect things like a freaking title on the book. <laughs> now, <clears throat> which one of these figures do you think is the author, if either of them is the author? Man. Why would you say the man is the author, Ezra? Because he's the dominant figure in the picture. Mm -hmm. What makes him dominant, though? What features make him appear dominant? Standing. Okay, he's standing, she's sitting, right? How is each of these figures addressing the viewer? He's looking at us, but she's like kind of looking like not straight at us. Like yeah. Us. She's, she's squinting and looks like she might be kind of looking off to the side, right? He's looking right at us, right? Hands relaxed behind his back, all that, right? In a kind of um, confident posture. Um, yeah, so if one of these figures is the author, probably him, right? But is there something, we, like if one of these figures is the author, is there something weird about having two people on the book cover? 
if you look at the author photo on a book, if it's only one person wrote the book, right, do they usually have another person in the picture with them? So that in and of itself is kind of weird, right? That would be another kind of you know, anomaly. Can we determine anything about the relationship between these two figures? Well, do we, th does the picture give us enough information to say that? Yeah, there's, unfortunately we don't have enough evidence to make that kind of claim, right? There are a man and a woman appearing in a picture together, but we don't see, we don't see either the hands, so we don't see wedding rings, right? They're not touching each other, so we can't necessarily infer any kind of romantic relationship, right? We can't really even tell if they're brother or sister, or if they're just friends, or if they're strangers, right? What is the only thing that can, what is the only clue, like clue we can, what is the only thing we can say for certain about the way this relationship is, is depicted um, in the picture? Pay attention to their positioning. The man is standing over her. Yeah, that the man is standing over her, right? So the only thing we can infer is that she is subordinate to him in some way, the way the thing is depicted, right? Which would be interesting like in light of the hippie nature of the picture as well, right? That, yeah, they might be hippies, but they are still replicating certain conservative traditional gender roles, right? In fact, the way she's kind of sitting at his feet makes her seem almost like the disciple listening to the guru, right? Now what about the Ben Franklin picture looming in the background? What, why, why, would that, why is that there? Why is that positioned in relation to these two figures the way it is? Why has the photographer made sure to get that in the shot? It establishes location. Okay, it establishes location, right? This way, you know, if you are someone who is familiar with San Francisco, you will recognize this particular park that they're standing in. It's like, oh yeah, there's that Ben Franklin statue. Yeah, I know where that is. Why else might they, like, why Ben Franklin specifically? Why might an author want to appear on the cover of a book with Ben Franklin hovering above and behind him. Yeah, there's a level of comparison there, right? And I think the background placement here, right, indicate is supposed to indicate like an influence hovering behind, right? placing himself in the same tradition, right? I am in the same tradition of revolutionary American letters as Benjamin Franklin, right? So that is what that is, you know, whether you pick that up or not depends on, you know, how well you're reading the context, but that's the, one, one could argue that that's what it's meant to signal, right? That here's an American author in the vein of Benjamin Franklin. Now, if I were to make, we already talked a little bit about how we can't make claims that we don't have sufficient evidence for, right? What if I were to say that these two individuals are members of a bizarre cult that worships tentacle monsters in underground temples? Well, you can't disprove That's it, true. right? But there's also, there's nothing in the picture to suggest that, right? So any interpretation that you come up with of any object or any text has to be, on the one hand, supported by the evidence, right? And it also has to be plausible. It has to be something that another reasonable person could see in the picture, even if they don't necessarily agree with your interpretation, right? So you know, basic rule of thumb here when interpreting anything 
don't make shit up. <laughs> make sure that it's actually suggested by evidence, right? Supported by evidence. Okay, so we're going to try something a little bit different um, that I will help you through. I have um, some song lyrics here. This is a song uh, by a guy by the name of John Prime. And as you are reading the lyrics and listening to the song, I want you to think about a couple of things, right? Okay, one is the context behind it, right? What does the context tell you, right? The song was recorded in 1971, and think about the genre in these terms as well. Like, what kind of music is it? Because that will also tell you something about what the song is trying to do, right? Look, once again, for patterns of similarity binary oppositions and anomalies and once you've gone through and done that right then we will try to work together towards generating one or more claims about the song right so just follow along with the lyrics um, while I play the song. Um, you can, by the way, write on the sheet that I gave you. Um, I don't need those back. Ralph digesting, readers digest. In the back of the dirty bookstore, a plastic flag with a gun on the back, fell out on the floor. Well, I picked it up and ran out. Thank you. 
few minutes with this, see what you can come up with. Um, I'll be right back. Remember to keep context in mind here, right? What kind of song is it? What kind of song is it? How typical is it of that particular genre? And when is it recorded, right? What historical events or whatever might it be referring to?
Just take another two minutes with this. Go over it, make sure you're catching all the repetitions, all of the oppositions. Do you have something you're itching to say, Nick? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So shoot, what do you got? Um, so the genre of the song is, I would say, a low-key parody of country music. Okay. Or the guitar is the main instrument being used. Okay, and you think it sounds like a parody yeah. of a country song. What makes you think it's a parody of a country song? Okay, yeah, it's kind of anti-nationalist, and yeah, it seems to be critical of unthinking patriotism, right? Um, but that doesn't take away from the, the, the qualities of the genre itself. Okay, um, why not, Ezra? Well, I mean, there are other, I mean, maybe not during that time, but there uh -huh. are other instances of country artists, right. bluegrass artists, that sure. don't focus on the message of patriotism and drinking beers with your trucks. So. <laughs> that is, yeah, I mean, but we tend to align right, the politics of country values. music with more conservative values, right? right. But, but that doesn't limit it. Yeah, that doesn't <clears throat> limit it, and that's also not, um, it's also like, um, if we think about the time period as well, like if country music has actually become more conservative over time. Right. There is a fair amount of country protest music like particularly from the 60s and 70s. And I think if we locate it in this particular time period, that'll tell us a little bit more about what's going on. But I think, I think you're right. I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily a parody of a country song, but yeah, it is, the values are a little bit left of where a country song's values usually are, right? Um, 1971, what does that tell us about what the song is concerned about? The Vietnam. Yeah, Vietnam War. And what do we know, if anything, about the Vietnam War? Americans did not support it. Yeah, it was not, a, it was not a popular war, right? It had um, a lot of civil unrest. Yeah, iffy popular support. There was a lot of civil unrest at the time, right? Um, pardon? Didn't they have a protest against that? Uh, yeah, they're right. I think, yeah, there was uh, in 1970. Right. Uh, the Kent State shootings, right? Um, a group of National Guardsmen fired on a group of student protesters um, who were protesting. They weren't specifically protesting the Vietnam War. They were actually protesting the war's expan illegal expansion into Cambodia, right? But yeah, so there is a lot of civil unrest in very, very recent history over this particular conflict, right? And in fact, how does 
the lyric refer to the war? Dirty. dirty little war, right? Yeah. Heaven's already overcrowded from your dirty little war. Is this the only use of the word dirty in the song? Yeah. While digesting Reader's Digest in the back of a dirty bookstore. Now, what does he probably mean by a dirty bookstore? Dusty. Could, well, could be literally dusty, right? What else might he mean? Dirty bookstore would be like an adult bookshop. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he's sitting in the back of a porn shop reading Reader's Digest, which is a weird it's place ironic, to be reading. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but there is a point to it, right? He's associating that kind of, that dirty with the dirty of the war, right? I wonder if that talks about, like, or if it purposely related to, uh, oh, all of the brothels that, like, the soldiers would visit on their off times in Vietnam. It might. Yeah. That's a possibility. I think that the association is probably a little more general, though. Right. Uh huh. He's also a blind patriot. Right. Blind and he's reading um, a, a, cons a fairly conservative magazine in that bookstore. He's reading Reader's Digest. Do people even read Reader's Digest anymore? Is that still a thing? Old people. I don't know. Old people. <laughs> well, well, but, but, that, but that's always been the case. Yes. <laughs> Old people have always loved Reader's Digest. Oh, there's nothing. Well, there are a few things old white people love more than Reader's Digest. Oh, God. Um, but yeah, okay, so why don't we try then to break down, so we, this is one pattern of repetition, right? Where we have the word dirty used in two contexts, right? The bookstore where he first finds his little flag decal. And the war that the song is protesting, right? What other patterns of repetition or similarity do we see here? He keeps collecting flags, pretty much everywhere he goes, he keeps collecting more. Okay, yeah, this, where else do we see this kind of like language of collection or consumption? He goes to the, uh, I mean, he gets to the, they offer like 10 flags or something. Okay, yeah, he goes to a bank, and they give him a whole bunch of flags, right? What's he doing to the Reader's Digest? Digest. He's digesting Reader's Digest, right? What else in the song, where else do we see like a pattern of consumption here? Okay, yeah. Heaven is consuming the dead from the war, right? Sure. What does he do with these flags that he's getting? He sticks them mostly on his windshield, right? Where else does he stick them? Life. Yeah. So what's he sticking his uh, little flag decals on? Things that people will see. Things that people will see, right? Things will be openly displayed, right? Well, how else are these things related in this guy's in this guy's mind in all likelihood? They're things he thinks he owns, right? They're things he thinks of as his property, right? So, this is mine, stick a flag on it. This is mine, stick a flag on it. My wife. Right, so not only is he consuming and collecting flags, right? He is also using them to display ownership. So, what do we usually use a flag to represent? Yeah, a flag. It's yeah, a flag is a set of, it's, you know, it's it's a piece of cloth that symbolizes um, a country. It has the the emblem of a country on it. So we typically use it to symbolize, right, 
a particular nation's values. And when somebody goes around sticking flags on things, they're claiming them, right? Um, how many of you are familiar? Have any of you heard of uh, Eddie Izzard? Uh, he's a stand-up comedian. Okay, you know him a little bit. Okay. He, pardon? Is it a little slower? Ed, Eddie Izzard. Oh. He's, he's a British comic, um, and he does a bit um, in a stand-up show on flags, on how um, you know the British claimed half the world through the cunning use of flags. Right? They would just show up somewhere, plant a flag. And the people who lived there would say, well, you can't, hey, wait, you know, what are you doing? Like, you can't claim us, right? This is our country, we live here. And the British would respond, do you have a flag? <laughs> and they would say, well, no, but, you know, we've always lived here. No flag, no country. Those are the rules, right? So, yeah, we often use flags to represent not just the nation's values, but also ownership, right? So what other ideas do we see then related to the idea of a flag. What, what else is the flag being connected to in the song? We've got it being related to ownership. We've got it related to, to uh, nationalism. What, what, what did you say, Grace? I'm sorry. Heaven. To heaven. Okay. And what's the relationship between the flag and heaven? Access to heaven. Like just, the not privilege. Privilege. just because you put a flag in heaven doesn't mean Yeah. There's a fundamental opposition there, right? between the values represented by the flag decal, right, the values of consumerism, of nationalism, and of ownership, and actually getting into heaven, right? The flag is actually what stops you, right? The verse, you know, the chorus part says, you know, now Jesus don't like killing no matter what the reason's for, right? So blind patriotism, as the song argues, right, leads you to support things that are antithetical to Christian values and will thus actually, thus will stop you from getting into heaven, right? So... That's the basic message here, right? So we've done a little bit of picking apart how it gets there, right? So if we were to try to build this into a claim, right, something that could become a thesis, here's how we might do it, right? So we know that a number of ideas are symbolized here by the flag, right? So, <clears throat> we could say that the song attempts to sort of dissociate religious values from other values associated or associated with or applied to the American flag by pointing out the incompatibility of warmongering and consumerism with Christian values. Now, we may revise that particular thesis, that particular claim, as we continue to look more deeply at the song, right? But this would give us a good beginning, right? One that is solidly based in evidence that we've observed, right? You know, we may work some of that context into this eventually, right? So what, what is, is, it, is it something specific about the Vietnam War? that informs this, right? Is there, some, is there sp some specific reason why country is chosen as the vehicle for this, right? Why, why that's the particular genre in which this is expressed. 
But this gives us a good start that is actually rooted in evidence that's in front of us, right? Anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, did you have something, Nick? Um, just like a tiny hypothesis. Is the, yeah. He doesn't say American flag. Or he doesn't no. American You're right. He never says American. Yeah. So it could be like pointing at any possible country that could follow in the footsteps of going into wars and killing others. Yeah. So you've already pointed out a flaw in my initial claim here, right? That I have specifically referred to the American flag. Assuming that because this is an American artist, well, no, performing no, an American no, genre. No, no, he does say Betsy, Betsy Ross. That's true. He, yeah. Yeah, he, he does say Betsy Ross, yeah. But the references to the flag could be interpreted more generally. That, these, right. that the values we associate with a flag of ownership and nationalism are in general antithetical, right? So, yeah, we could broaden the claim a little bit in that way. But, yeah. yeah Your right. claim wouldn't necessarily be disproven because of that. No. But it, it might be something that I would want to take into account. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Um, he says it won't change heaven anymore. Like, at one point, apparently it did, and now it doesn't anymore. Like, that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. That also is interesting. That, it, it sort of, that signifies a change in values over time, right? And kind of falling away from an older value. Yeah, Jackson. Is that referring to because uh, heaven's already overcrowded? because of the Vietnamese people dying? And like we thought, or people thought they were innocent and we were killing them for no reason? Does the song specify though which dead it's talking about? No, no. Not necessarily, it right? It says yeah. that, uh, it's from, it says that Jesus don't like killing no matter what the reason's for. Yep. So yeah, and I think what he's pointing out there is that the relative, uh, if we look at, the Ten Commandments, right? What's the what's the least ambiguous of them? Not Thou shalt not kill, kill, right? Yeah. Yeah, Nick. Um, instead of it being a, um, something antithetical, maybe he's pointing out a hypocrisy in which we're a nation under God, yet we kill ruthlessly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that I mean I think that goes along with the idea of that being antithetical to you know the the values of warmongering and consumerism are antithetical with that other value that we place, that we put on the coins, and that we put on the, you know, the presidential seal and all that. Okay, so does everybody get how we got here, though, how, how we did this? Okay, so what, I'm, what we're going to do now, right, I'm going to give you a set of pieces of evidence. It's on both sides of this sheet. Um, I've got my source of it for it on here as well, because you should always cite your source, right? What I want you to do is look at this set of evidence, look at this set of data, try to come up with at least three claims about it that you can directly connect to the data. And try to come up with claims that account for as much of the data as possible, right? Try to come up with at least three claims that account for multiple pieces of evidence and be able to explain the logical links. So go ahead and get started as soon as you've got the sheets.
once again, go ahead and write on the sheet if you want to. I don't know you I, I don't need these back.
take another five minutes. If you haven't come up with any claims yet, try to do so, right? And try to rank the claims that you do come up with in order of strength, right? With the strongest being the one that accounts best for the most evidence. Two more minutes.
it. Your best claim. The evidence from which you drew it and the logical connection. Anybody? I said that cars provide for changes in infrastructure. Okay. That cars have clearly driven changes in the way we build. Okay. Um, and uh, what's what's your log what evidence are you using to make that claim? Um, I looked at where I said that uh, newer American towns are built in a way that would require like a car for speedy travel because they're mm -hmm. not built in grids. Okay. Um, it's with the longer roads that file out into a single road. Right, right. Um, okay. And, and then I said that, uh, that homes before 1950, so I would assume cars were not prevalent among Americans. Mm -hmm. so or certainly didn't. less so, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so they didn't have a garages or carports attached to their homes mm -hmm. and, and then it said after 1950 uh, neighborhoods had less sidewalks so I assume less people are walking because they were driving mm -hmm. um, and then it said that suburban neighborhoods rarely have public tra transportation and I said they're built in a way that people would drive cars that live in those neighborhoods. Right yeah they're they're built in, so in right so you, you used that evidence to determine that these neighborhoods are built in ways that make it difficult to get around if you don't have a car, right? That tend to assume that the people who live there are going to have cars. All right, good. Um, who else? Yeah, Nick. Um, suburban living areas have been built in such a way to maximize population density by clustering whole um, family houses together. Okay. Um, there is one kind of wrinkle I'm going to throw into that, though. If we look at suburban neighborhoods, typically, what kinds of houses do we find in suburban neighborhoods? Usually like two-story houses. And how many families can you usually live in? One. Just one, right? Whereas, in an urban neighborhood, you can build upward, right? You can build multi-story buildings that may not be as wide or on as much land as a one-story family house, but where you can have multiple families living in the same building, right? So if we're talking about efficient land use for increasing population density, which is, which is, going, to be, which is going to be better? Yeah, you can actually fit more people into an urban neighborhood than you typically can in a suburban neighborhood. And that may not have been entirely clear from the set of evidence that you were given. What else? What else you guys got? After World War II, both American technology and American living arrangements co evolved at a fast enough rate to shift America from more conservative values to more like a modern day values. Okay, what do you mean by conservative and modern values? By conservative, you know, how they used to, like, you said, shift away from centralized downtowns and then, you know, uh -huh. shift away from um, the, the grid setup mm -hmm. to more of like the cul de sac setup. And then okay. They also said before 1950 they really had garages, mm -hmm. and now it's they really had sidewalks after 1950, which is the cars coming on. Okay. Okay. So I, I think um, I agree with your basic premise, right? I think your basic reading of the evidence is good, but I would quibble a little bit with the wording because I don't know if there's anything necessarily conservative about um, centralized downtowns, right? Um, I think you're putting political implications into something that doesn't necessarily follow along a conservative liberal dichotomy, right? So what I might do um, in your cases, right, is talk instead about the replacement of small towns with suburban neighborhoods, right? So yeah, I, I would um, place it more in a suburban versus small town um, dichotomy. But otherwise, yeah, otherwise good reading of the evidence, yeah. Um, anybody else? Anybody come up with something different? One more and I'll let you all go home. Okay. <coughs> Looks like we'll be stuck here. <laughs> Just one more volunteer. Come on. Okay. You know, with um, like separate like lawns. Uh huh. And, and you know, them also closing 
build what new construction is in their in their areas like near near their neighborhoods. Where right. The urban areas don't care. I mean, they just want as many people as possible. Right. Well, and, and yeah, when we think about sort of like urban density as well, right? You know, um, if more people are getting around on foot, does it matter too much if things are clustered close to each other? It's actually an, an advantage, right? Yeah, exactly. If the school and the hospital and the shopping area and the restaurants are all right in one place, if people are mostly walking to get around, that's good, right? You want that. But yeah, so why wouldn't people, it seems paradoxical that people like wouldn't want to live near a school or near a hospital, right? But why don't they in a suburban neighborhood? Right. Yeah, because it increases traffic, right? So yeah, good, that, yeah, actually a yeah, really good claim, good reading the evidence. All right, so you guys can go now, right? And you should be a weekend. See you on Tuesday.